right, welcome everyone to day number 10 of our 2021 summer season here at Colonial Downs. Jason Beam, track announcer here with Jessica Paquette, our track analyst, handicapper, and maybe announcer for uh, Jumpy Race on uh, Monday. We'll see. Stay tuned. <laughs> I hope I'm I, I I told her I you, you met we you know we talked about it last week on the show and uh, I just want to watch a race at Colonial from the apron I've never gotten to do that you know I'm happy to oblige for you right, and I'd well, like to watch one from the booth so we'll, yeah we'll... there you go I feel like worst case too like maybe someday I'll have Daryl do one I can go to that way I could go like hang out in the paddock with you and walk around and visit the people right I love no, the people. you I, are a man of the people so not a man <laughs> I run up to that room I lock the door as soon as I can get there <laughs> Uh, Jess, let's talk about this card. I was just telling you before we, we start recording, it's, it's, we're just, you know, recording Saturday morning, it's raining a lot, but, uh, as we've discovered the track here dries out very quick, it's supposed to be sunny all day, Sunday and all throughout the week. So I, I feel like we should be fast and firm. No problem. I feel like it could torrentially rain, yeah. uh, you know, on Monday morning and we still might be fast and firm. That turf course takes water so well. We should not jinx it though. Let's just, let's, let's have a little rain wrap up today. If we can, uh, let's uh, get into our uh, Monday card, 11 races. Of course, the uh, two jump races again are listed as races 10 and 11 in your programs. They're non-wagering events before the races, but they are uh, streamed on the uh, national steeplechase website. I forget the website offhand. Do you happen to know it? Uh, it's just Google NSA and yeah. you'll find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it, that's exactly what it is. Um, anyways, first race on the car, Jess, we started out maiden claimers on the main track at, uh, six furlongs and kind of one of those, you know, lower level maiden races where there's not a ton of form to speak of. And you kind of got to do some dissecting. I feel like to find uh, contenders in here. Less starts the better. And I'm going with number one, Diva Gal. She only has that debut effort under her belt. And while that wasn't particularly good, I think she can move forward off of that. A lot can happen for a horse between start one and start two. I feel like we've seen a little more Charlestown success this year than we had in previous years. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a small sample as most of our seasons are, as they're pretty quick here, but uh, Gary Williams Jr. is a barn who hasn't won yet. And I feel like I've liked several of his horses. So sure. uh, I, I do, I do like his silks. They're, they're a lovely lime green with kind of a dark uh, uh, green thing, a, like a clover on them. So they're easy to spot. So shout out to Gary. Uh, I saw that uh, favoritism role was given to the number five lady Tismo, who is a horse who has run, you know, not a ton of times, but eight times and really just kind of has one decent third, a couple starts back. And other than that, a lot of double digit defeats. I'm curious, uh, maybe why Merv made this horse so low. Uh, yeah, I couldn't actually figure that out. I mean, she does have a little bit of tactical speed. These are uh, live connections, yeah. I guess. You will not find me taking eight to five on a bottom maiden. I yeah. just can't. There's no, maybe she beats me, but I'm, I'm going to try to beat her. I thought Port Eve was worth mentioning too in the opener. Uh, it goes for a new connection. So obviously, I mean, assuming with the owner trainer a private sale after the last start, um, you know, at least showed speed last time and it showed speed a couple times. To me, you got to kind of sometimes in these races just look for little hints of positivity. Yeah, that's really wheeling right back after that race yeah. at Gulfstream, though. That's for me, I want kind of wonder for a horse that they're shipping, they're racing yeah. and they're shipping kind of in under a week. It's a big ask, I think. Yeah. Your picks for the uh, first race? One, six, five, and three. We uh, move on to race number two. We start our early pick four in race number two each and every day. And the late pick four, of course, always covers the final four races. Just a field of six in here. And uh, favoritism uh, went to Pink Pearl at nine to five, two to one on Bethabra. Um, you know, both uh, kind of horses that are dropping in class for this spot, I guess, uh, somewhat logical favorites, but not necessarily horses that are in any kind of good form. I like both of them a little bit. I think kind of class will just carry here. I did go with the four Beth Barra on top. I thought she was making up ground reasonably well last time out. I think she's a little bit interesting on the cutback in distance here. She's been primarily a, like a long distance type of turf horse. And while yeah. she hasn't won sprinting, she's been competitive. Uh, I don't think you're going to get, I mean, she was such a big price last time, yeah. at, at, you know, and really didn't run that badly, but we'll see what kind of, what the board looks like. I'm interested to see how this, race shakes out betting wise yeah you go back to the uh, five furlong sprint i think it was four starts back and finished fifth but was definitely closing at the end and uh, making up some ground in in a race that the winner came back and won so maybe the uh, the dirt sprint and actually the six and a half dirt sprint the horse shows on the page is not too bad either so maybe uh it's one that's going to join it looks like pink pearl definitely uh i mean you want to say speed but that's all going long turfing i mean it's just a different race and i i feel like if that horse is not in a comfortable spot in the field where it wants to be that might not be a good end result come uh, stretch time sure and you actually look back to some of her if you really do a deep dive some of her turf sprints she is she does make more of a rally from off the pace. Yeah. so she's kind of a tactical interesting sort of horse that way uh 
And then uh, the horse on the outside, Sweet Song, uh, coming up from uh, Lone Star. We've seen a couple of Lone Star uh, shippers this meet. Uh, this one dropping out of uh, allowance conditions down to the 25, but non three. And uh, again, I think uh, a horse is taking a drop, but like you go back to you know Sam Houston in the winter, like this horse was running for much, much cheaper and not faring well. Yeah, and her turf form actually hasn't been very good. I'm yeah. I have some questions whether this horse actually wants to be on the grass, but I do like that she has a little bit of speed. If she can maybe show that, she could put her in contention. That yeah. recent workout at Colonial seems like it was pretty sharp. It's interesting here because we talked about, you know, the races here don't really come off the grass hardly ever. And so you, you don't see those entries of horses like you will at other tracks that where you, you can kind of guess maybe they're hoping it comes off kind of thing. Yeah, no, they're staying yeah. on. They're, they're <laughs> on or we're canceled. There's not really an in-between. Yeah, they, well, that's happened too. Uh, your picks for the second, Jess? Four, five, six, and two. Uh, race number three on the card at uh, five and a half furlongs over the outer turf. I actually have one in here. I really like uh, as far as uh, the, the entire day is concerned. We have yeah. Sacred Sunday, who was a nice debut winner last time out. Uh, Independence Law for Liddy Curtin. It's uh, almost one last time out. But I, I thought uh, actually, you know, the first couple of races not featuring a ton of decent form. This race, I thought, has a fair number of horses uh, with some form. This race is very competitive, and I did go with number four, Sacred Sunday, trying winners for the first time. I liked that maiden win, and boy, has the Mike Tomlinson barn just oh. been so live. Yeah. They look as good in the paddock as they run, and you're just kind of, kind of consistently seeing them come out really look the part, run the part. And I liked that last race. I thought, you know, she beat a solid enough field, good tactical speed, and uh, it kind of did everything right. And qualified for this uh, condition as far as the starter allowance, $25,000 sure. level. Um what about the the switch to turf for that horse? Uh, you know, she's obviously debut on the dirt was good, and she's been working on the dirt. Uh, what do you make about the turf switch here? Plenty of turf influence in the pedigree. It makes sense. Uh, she's one I really want to get a good handle on in the paddock and see if she mm -hmm. kind of looks like a turf horse. Uh, you know, when I was evaluating her last time, I wasn't thinking turf. I was just looking at her dapples because all of Mike's horses come out just crazy dappled. So I think I you know I think taking her physical build into consideration might help. But I, I liked that last race. Uh, I, I was really interested in the three Moana's power who was 94 to one in a stakes race a couple weeks ago and didn't run all that bad was kind of in contention in mid stretch uh, before flattening out a little bit. You know, my theory, especially on week two here was that the, the inside was not a good place to be. And this was a horse who kind of rallied up the inside and just kind of kicked out at the top of the lane and, uh, and still just kind of kept on grinding. So I, I'm thinking that this one liked the grass uh, should appreciate a little bit of class relief, uh, you know, getting away from the stakes runners. And I thought, uh, you know, obviously 94 to one, would be better than three to one but you know we'll uh it's a you know it's a different competition level your uh your picks for uh, race number three well back to that uh, yep. your selection here that barn has been so live with some with some yeah, long yeah. shots this season just you're just a barn that's flying under the radar and kind of consistently popping up and in, in the exotics or winning yep. with these big big prices and also silks you like you have to like the batman silks oh, right I love, the, I love the batman so the only yeah, problem the is a couple times there's been two or three of them in the same race that's when i don't like them. <laughs> sure sure um no, batman cool. silks i find delightful yeah they're they're pretty rad uh carlos muñoz who we're talking about um you know he's had yeah, a couple of the first time starters that have popped at, at big price not one but uh you know ran very well as you said i mean two for 29 so he's he's running a lot of horses but 11 times out of 29 in the trifecta so they're uh his horses are running for sure and uh, and he'll and he'll run them your your picks for the third four seven two and one the uh, fourth race on the program uh this was one of those races it's a non-winners of the year but for me as a as a horse player these races come up once in a while where the horses that look the most logical and the most obvious to me are like the top two choices. And I feel like those races are just recipes for not great betting situations, but I just thought the six and the 10 looked much the best in here. Right there with you. I no. mean, I put number six, jumpstart my heart on top, getting a little bit of class relief. This is one of those classy veterans, 20, 27 starts, five wins. And I think sometimes these veteran horses, after they have a couple of kind of tough beats, they need a confidence yeah. booster to remember how to do the job. Um, really has been a solid mid Atlantic type for several years. And I think she's better than that recent record indicates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Important to remember too, the non winners of the year here, it seems to be more so the general rule has been non winners in six months, right? Like that's yeah. uh, so even though you might see the N one, why it's uh, it's more specifically six months. Cause uh, that horse you just mentioned has a win, I think back in October. So uh, jumpstart my heart. And so, uh, you know, not necessarily a horse that hasn't won in a, in a long time. I mean, it was three starts ago, <laughs> but eligible for the condition. That's it. Yeah. Got to read the condition book properly. That's it. And the uh, 10th race or the 10 horse, I should say the Ferris Allen runner, another one who's, you know, dropping out of that 12, five level, just, I mean, has been knocking on the door at that level. And so this one, 
you know, the 5,000 drop makes sense. They claim the horse for five. So it's not like they're losing if the horse gets reclaimed. And, uh, you know, I think, I just think those two are just ahead of everybody. Did, was there anybody else price wise that kind of jumped into your selections that maybe was interesting? I mean, I'm using number eight princess kill maybe a little bit more of a price here, mm-hmm. but, uh, I think this is a horse that's just, just been competing against tougher. And I think stretching out to two ter- to a uh, long distance race here yeah. is pretty interesting. The distance is a little bit of a question mark, but mm-hmm. she's run well at seven for as long as the X yeah. little bit should be fine. Yeah. And the, yeah, the Mountaineer seven, I guess I alter seven or it's other than Belmont alter for seven furlongs or two turns. So I guess yeah. I was going to, I was going to say. Hey, it's two turns of Mountaineer, but I think they all are, except for Belmont. So uh, your picks for that fourth race, Jess. Six, ten, eight, and one. Fifth race on the card, we begin our late pick five, and we're at a, a mile on the inner turf course. Again, if you're new to Colonial, the general rule is the uh, mile and mile on the 16th, mile and eighth are uh, on the inner, and then the uh, sprints are on the outer. Uh, I thought uh, highly noted certainly looks like lone speed in here, which we know speed hasn't been great. It did start to carry a little better, it seemed like, the last day of the week last week. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I think we're starting to see maybe a little bit of a trend uh, where you, you may want to be a little bit closer up than you have been. Yeah, I mean, it was just it just seemed like for a week, about four days where the racing the week two and then the first couple of uh, week three, it was like everybody was out wide or swinging out and they, all those moves were coming down the center of the track. But uh, as a man, and when CC Lopez on board, we saw him get a couple of wins the other two day. Two wins uh, on his 61st yeah. birthday good for him yeah yeah i mean he after a slow start to the meet but he you know he's always been a solid rider and, and has always fared pretty well here uh, i saw kark is in this race uh was was here uh didn't run so well for sixteen thousand non non-winners of two they dropped the price a little bit here but uh, where did you land in this race i went with number 10 hypnotist uh mm-hmm. beaten favorite last time out and i know that was a pretty dull effort but i'm giving this horse the benefit of the doubt here probably needed one off of a 10-month layoff and as a pedigree nerd this one was really fun to look up uh dan was a french group one winner and is out of a half to brilliant judd mod horses sight seek and tate's creek so this horse just has some class in uh, his pedigree and i uh, you know the horse i this is a barn that I know a little bit of a slow start from limited starters, but I think we'll start to pick up some steam. Kevin Gomez off to a very good start here as, as well at, uh, at colonial downs. And I, I agree with you. I, I had this one kind of start as, as one to watch just because the race was so bad. I almost got to just draw a line through it type effort, you know, just, just, I'm for, guessing this barn didn't have yeah. this horse cranked to 110% off the bench. Yeah. And so uh, I, I, I just, it was, it was almost like, I would rather have it be this bad than like a seventh beaten five or something yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. Cause if anything, it might spice up the price, right? People are going to see that and say, no, no, this was the same level. And uh, you know, cause I, what was the horse last time? Five to two and uh, six to one on the morning line. Uh, Merv made the horse this time. Uh, we should mention Tijuana brass who uh, comes out of the lyrical gangster race. Uh, I thought looked home in this, you know, similar condition and, and just got nailed in the last jump lyrical gangster, of course, ran off in the, uh, post parade the other day and yes uh, i was <laughs> looking forward to that race to kind of use that as a gauge going yeah. forward but well uncle I mean, armando still ran in that one right uh yeah i'm, yeah. I'm not going to mess maybe use that one as a gauge going forward but <laughs> but, but yeah. tijuana brass is also yeah. kind of cool um really neat female family on this one as well the second dam's grade one winner katinka so sort of enough back class to, to be a little bit interesting yeah, we've seen a couple long layoff horses. Keneal Bay, the one, is another one of those we haven't seen since uh, 2019. I'm really curious to see how far Highly Noted can take them. I mean, just a, just looks like complete lone speed. I mean, you, you'd think in a big field like this, there would be some other speed. There just really isn't. I mean, there's just a lot of off-the-pace types in here. Sure. Yeah, funny little race. I'm also, is Al Fierro was another one that ran at Tampa and won on the dirt. It was an off-the-turf race. And then had a bad start last time, but just really ran poorly. I'm curious if they're going to try the turf again with this one. But if it goes bad, I got to think they maybe go back for the uh, the dirt. But obviously, you know, harder to get on the dirt here at Colonial. Jess, your picks, your picks for race five. 10, 7, 8, and 9. Six race on the card. We are turf sprinting on winners of two $16,000 runners over the outer turf course. And uh, I, I thought it kind of interesting. Uh, both numbers seven and eight were horses who, you know, kind of got to turf sprinting last time. And I know the seven had done it two starts in a row, but it seemed like it really woke them up by going to the lead. And I'm curious now which one. Of, I feel like they're both going to be like, hey, this is our way to win. We got to go fight it out now. Sure. And I, I used the seven crack the safe on top. I kind of just like him trying winners for the first time. Looks like he caught a pretty legitimate field that day as well. Third place finisher came back to win. And I like that this horse just seems to have made massive improvement from his two-year-old to three-year-old year. Sometimes that's all it takes. It's just yeah. a little bit of time to mature and grow up. Yeah. That first uh, start off the bench was against a little bit tougher and it was, it was promising. And obviously uh, the, it, you can see the comment jump tracks. And uh, so obviously a little bit of a, a not, 
smooth journey that day, but uh, just seemed to put it all together last time out on the turf. Obviously, it's a different turf course here. I was at Pimlico on Saturday, and, uh, you know, it's uh, a little little choppier there at the end of their meet. It's been a long meet for them that they usually don't have. And so, um, you know, be curious to see how this one uh, finds the footing into this one. Tempting moment, the one to the outside was kind of another one who just seemed to put it together last time. If you go way, way back to this horse's other two colonial turf starts uh, sprinting, or at least the, the first two that show up on its page, like they were close to the lead and pretty decent third place finishes. And I just, I got to think that they're going to think, Hey, we went wire to wire last time. We got to get out there and uh, go. So uh, Maria Scalda I think that was her first win here in, uh, in the U S if I remember correctly. This was the horse that was quite, di- quite difficult in the paddock. I believe okay. prior to this race, if, if I were, if my memory serves me correct, I'd have to go back and check yeah. some of my notes, but I think this one was a little bit of a, a wild child in the paddock. The other horse I wanted to mention was the uh, three Bodie Cody. That was kind of a funny race that uh, Freddie Soto race because the top two choices who were big favorites scratched out of it. The rest of the field were not really turf sprinters. And this horse wasn't as so turf sprinter, but put in a pretty decent run, kind of made a nice move from about the quarter to the eighth pole. Uh, you know, I know it shows the horse gaining, but I thought flattened out just a smidge, but um, I just thought a, a price horse may be worth uh, watching here. But uh, where'd you land in race six, Jess? Seven, six, nine, and eight. Seven, six, nine, eight. If we're just in the sixth race, we start the late pick three. We're going five furlongs over the outer turf course. And um, the uh, Averill racing horses, uh, Gerald Bennett, to his first starter here at the meet. And it seems like all the Averill horses I see down in South Florida, they're just all really, really fast, early turf sprinter types. And this one's quick, but not like blazing quick. Uh, curious to see kind of where this one lands. But uh, who was your top pick here in this race? I went with the eight Brewster flats lightly raced. I think trying the turf for the first time is sort of an interesting angle here. Mm -hmm. Her form's been, you know, suspect. We'll say we'll be generous and say this year, but the dam was a winner on both turf and synthetic. So I think the switch to grass really makes a little bit of sense. I think you might get more to 10 to one just because of the bad recent form. Uh, I'll take a swing. Yeah. Why not? I mean, to some degree, I feel like those have been a lot of your best hits. This one are, are ones where you're, kind of going outside the box uh, on some of these long shots. We've seen prayer hope win. there was another long shot that I'm forgetting that you had that was, uh, you know, cut back off the jumps and so, you know, getting prices, it's, they're not going to be obvious horses, right? That's part of the deal. And well, and that's part of the job, right? Yeah. It's like, is we have to kind of find something beyond what's in the past performances. Yeah. And I think, you know, looking for a way to make this horse make sense on turf, you have to look to pedigree and there. There's enough of an angle there. The, uh, I wanted to mention the number six, uh, dare to try the Patrick Nushbarns horses, you know, one win from four starts, two seconds. They've, they've been running pretty good. Uh, comes from Anthony Dutro's barn, uh, off a long layoff. And, uh, you know, the horse had two kind of pretty good starts together between the maiden win and the first non-winners of two. And it just seemed to really fall apart after that. And it, you could see avoided claim in the one. And so, uh, I'm sure something a little bit of miss. So they gave the horse a break and, uh, it just seems like these horses are firing for him and Forrest Boyce kind of getting back in gear, uh, with a couple of wins last week, uh, just your picks for the seventh eight seven four and one the eighth race is our feature event on monday it's the van cleef stakes at a hundred thousand dollars and it's the first time we get to see hall of famer todd pletcher shows up hall of famer toddster yeah. uh I, that was the hall of fame ceremony yesterday was great um i'm pretty sure i wept through most of it it was it was wonderful now, i mean i can't think of anyone that deserves it more than todd and i think back to when I was a kid showing up at his barn, just like a weird horse girl to go pat the horses and how generous he was with his time and letting a bunch of unsupervised, supervised teenage girls just run amok through his barn. So I'll always be a big Toddster fan for that. Well, that being said, are you picking Apparate on top? I am not. I actually <laughs> didn't use Apparate at all. Um, big Toss Toddster fan. Toddster. But, yeah. But Sorry, off Todd. the Toddster today. Um, I, no, I didn't use this horse on top, but I'm going with a big swing. I swear Sweet Sandy has a big race in her. Um, I thought she looked really good last time, despite it being her first race since 2019. She looked maybe a little bit heavy, uh, like she could have u- used a race. Um, and I think she's in Mike Gore and my trust. I think this is a long shot that can at least hit the board here, and I'm sticking with that. But on top, I went with number five. That's Tasting the Stars. Yeah. Eating some chalk there, but I'm going to try to use some long shots to go along with her. Yeah, tasting the stars looked uh, looked really good uh, back on opening day. It was it was a really really nice performance. Uh, kind of came through down the inside and just uh, blew their doors off down the stretch. Um, I was kind of curious about it for speaking of long shots. I kind of thought Unruly Julie was a, a pretty good one last time out. That race did kind of fall apart a little bit. Puppy Monkey Baby came from uh, pretty far back to to get the win, and so it wasn't surprised that this horse came from far back. They went pretty fast, but. Um, 
I just thought it was a, a pretty solid effort and uh, maybe at a big price, uh, one that can come get it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different directions to go here. I don't know that princess theorem is going to be 10 to one. I just, because Brendan Walsh has been so good when he's come here, I know, I know they're coming off a layoff, but uh, you know, you see travel column in the, uh, in, in the results there. I mean, there's, I, I feel like there's some, yeah, if I can get 10 to one on this horse, that, yeah. I mean, there goes my mortgage for the month, maybe. And, you know, I, I'm not great about following the standings, but I got to think Joe Rocco Jr., if not atop the standings, is darn near him. Yeah. And yeah. just picking up these, you know, quietly picking up these live horses. Yeah. And again, the Brendan Walsh barn, practically unbeatable from limited starts so far. I like this horse a lot. The dam was yeah. a graded stakes winner on turf, has produced some black type runners. And at this point, with only, you know, such a handful of starts, this filly could be sort of any kind. Yeah. I love Nyquist as a stallion. What a pleasant surprise he has been at stud. Yeah. I mean, and she's been, you know, we've really only seen her as a two-year-old and early three-year-old. And so you got to think there's some development that happens in that three-year-old year as we get here later on. Right. When, when do you stop considering like, Oh, it's three-year-olds against older. Like at what point do three-year-olds to you just become there? They are older at that point. Well, it's such a strange thing because horses really don't physically mature until they're four or five, six. Oh, yeah. um, you kind of think of show horse world and I understand they're different breeds, but uh, you know, they're still the same species. And with, you know, with a young show horse, you're really not even kind of on their back for the first time until they're three or four. So thoroughbreds are so far ahead mm -hmm. in some ways, but they're also still, you know, physically developing the same way all horses do uh, I you know that's one of those things where you kind of have to take each horse really individually you know when you were a kid and there was the you know the kid in your grade that looked like he was five years older yeah, yeah. than you there are some there are some three two and three year olds that come out looking like you know grown ass grown adults yeah <laughs> all right don't worry we're adults um, watching <laughs> they come out looking like grown adult grown yeah. adults like right you know right out of the gate yeah David Ingram I still <laughs> I always use the example because we see so many two-year-olds who, who dominate. And I always use the example of like the kid who hits puberty and is throwing way faster than everybody in baseball. And then everybody catches up in high school and he's yeah. just an average pitcher, you know? And so that's sometimes the case, or it's like LeBron yeah. James who looked like a 35 year old yeah. when he was 16 and, and, and maintained that insane level of athleticism. Yeah. But it's pretty funny. Like there's in, in sports, there's some of those guys and maybe American Pharaoh was kind of like that, but like, you know, Connor McDavid and LeBron James and the, like the guys that are like so super hype, they almost always pan out. It seems like at least in the last many years, um, you know, like people, everybody just knows they're going to be great. Sidney Crosby was the same way. Uh, Zion Williamson, I guess the latest one, like, you know, I guess you can just kind of tell when they're at a different level like that. Yeah. And it can be a little bit different with horses too, because yeah. you, then you see these, uh, I think of, you know, like the Bob Baffert two-year-olds that each one comes out looking like the second coming and yeah. Not all of them really pan out as such. Yeah. The, uh, Jesse, your picks for the, uh, the Van Cleef. Five, eight, four, and seven. The uh, ninth race on the card. Usually I always say, Hey, bottom level maidens are going long. No, we're sprinting this time uh, with Ooh. the bottom level maidens, changing it up a little bit. Shout yeah. out Allison and the folks in the race office, but we do have a full field of 14 here. This is, yeah, I love these races. They are wacky. They're really tough to figure out. I went, you know, why not go for a big long shot with number nine, Free Steve, 20 to one on the morning line, trying the turf for the first time. Only one start. He has not yet disappointed me. And his inexperience is appealing. He has a lot of room to move forward and enough pedigree kind of on the, to indicate that maybe he moves up significantly on the turf. Well, the, uh, the final race Wednesday, we kind of saw that we saw a horse who had, I think was eased uh, in its first start at parks or something just came back and, you know, won at 25 to one. And yeah. I mean, to some degree, like you have that one start and ha they don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> it's like the, the chance for a wake up, I suppose is, is a lot better with those type of horses. And when you're getting 25 to one, you only got to be right every so often. That's it. And, and there are a couple of horses in this race that yeah. I think, you know, they've shown you all they have to offer at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah, I was, uh, for some reason, the Chitu horses, I always find a little bit interesting and little Chitu was kind of one of those, uh, just, you know, the, the two races on grass, like they were here, they were against better. They were two years ago, but I don't know. I just thought again, looking for wake up possibilities. Cause I think the five is the morning line favorite bloke. And it's just, this is like classic lower level maiden. You get, there's usually one or two horses in these races. That's consistently hitting the board or, you know, running decent speed figures and people bet those. Cause at least they know they're going to maybe be in the hunt. And it's yeah, like his a, two turf races have not been no. good though. Yeah, I'm not, go, they were I, I want stream, no still. part of, 
I no. want no part of that. I, I have fave to go against. That's my comment for that one. Uh, what about the, the the three Lamarkable was one I thought was uh, was worth talking about, too, uh, for Kevin Gomez and Alexander White. You know, small barn that's two for eight on the year, but uh, first time gelding, first time Lasix, new trainer, new surface, uh, kind of trying everything new for this one. Yeah, it looks like they went back to the drawing board and are throwing a bunch of things at the wall and seeing what sticks. But I I mean, I do I do like a first time gelding. I think the world needs more geldings. Very pro brain surgery here. Um, And, you know, racing with Lasix, trying turf for the first time. There's just so much like one of those things could move this horse up. I I used your brain surgery line on my show on Friday because there was a there was a horse who was having that particular angle and uh, I, I got an email from a listener and they were talking about that and she says she goes i feel like uh the female uh analysts find that a little funnier than the males do. you know <laughs> i said hey i know i i know the score i know i know what's you know i know what's going on uh yeah, anyway yeah, a little more focus is good for That's, everybody oh, believe me all right adjust your picks for the ninth race nine three one and ten the uh 10th race oh we're not done yet we are not done yet. We have steeplechase. You know, it's so bad. This is how bad I am. When I, when I handicapped the card, because I looked at them last night and, uh, and again this morning, but last night I got to the ninth race and I just stopped and I didn't even, for no other reason, just that we always run nine here. And so I see ninth race, I think, end, and then I go, oh, no, no. And, and we got to handicap. Yuppies. I was going to ask you, I don't know about the rating system. And the first race, the condition is uh, rated 115 or lower. What is the rating system? Okay. There are a bunch of steeplechase things I need to learn. Uh, okay. I will have that information for you by Monday. Okay. Well, yeah. Because, I, I mean, I'm assuming it's just there's a, there's a ranking rating system. It has and they to have, be, right? Yeah. But, I, 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 you know, Genonia comes into this race with three straight wins at, you know, similar level, including here last time. So I'm like, how is this one? below any rate system right now and this is a non-wagering event so yeah. you know we are watching this and enjoying this for the sheer sport of it yeah. and uh Genonia, boy was he impressive last time though he's also one of those just drop dead gorgeous type horses i mean he you can't take your eyes off him he's a, just a fabulous looking athlete mm-hmm. total winning machine going for his fourth straight win uh best efforts come on or near the lead too so he's the kind of that gets really brave out front um neil morris is you know very respected steeplechase and flat trainer and always offers some interesting insights on his horses whether they're racing on the flat or over fences um this one i think strictly the one to beat yeah the horse was uh, four to five on the flat two back and then came, i mean certainly in a good form regardless what you do the other thing i was going to ask about is because the six horse boss man is another one who likes to kind of at least last time and two starts back like to get to the lead and kind of open up and to some degree the seven court ruler at least used to um really interesting on court ruler the seven because the horse had three pretty damn good starts in a row there and uh was you know forwardly placed for most of those races and uh, winning or running second and then it just kind of the last two have just been really bad so one thing i've kind of i've learned from talking to uh some of the steeplechase folks is that the colonial steeplechase races play a little quicker uh-huh. than some of these races elsewhere i think from a pace standpoint you mean yeah okay. they, um so it is a little more favorable to these horses that have more speed out of the gate out okay. of not the gate out of just off the line yeah and, but they do tend to go a little bit quicker which is where some you're seeing come in even with good form it's mm-hmm. just not their kind of race your picks for the tips two one six and three the uh, 11th race, two miles, it's the Randolph Rouse Stakes and uh, $75,000 up for grabs for the uh, Phillies and Mares in uh, in this one in a, uh, a field of seven. Uh, where did you land here? I went with number four, uh, Down Royal, but number six, Can You Do the Twist, is sort of an interesting horse to watch. Mm-hmm. This horse is almost a runoff kind of right yeah. uh, off the line. She just goes has yet to be a, has yet to be able to really sustain that sort of speed mm-hmm. but i think the first time lasix is actually interesting i wonder if this is a horse who is a little bit anxious and kind of guns it and then runs out of steam a little bit yeah. uh Two but then, you know, the LASIK, a long way. It, it is a long way um <laughs> but i think the addition of lasix is actually really interesting there um down royal though game runner up effort behind a nice horse in the mean queen who we saw almost win at saratoga she was about to win but then got startled by the board because horses are horses yeah Uh, but this one has a nice turn of foot i think fits really well the uh selections for the 11th jess 
four, five, six, and two. All right. So that will wrap up our uh, Monday program as we're uh, just about the halfway point. I think midway through the Tuesday card will officially be the halfway point of the meet, uh, day 10. Uh, first post at 1.45 p.m. for the uh, flat wagering portion of the card, but uh, the jump race is at 12.15 and 12.50. Uh, best of luck out there today. We'll uh, be back again tomorrow and Wednesday, and uh, we'll see you guys at the track.